Welcome to Monday Morning with Mike and Max. And uh, yeah, I'm feeling great today. I did my, I'm on a training split where I do upper body push, an upper body pull, and then a leg day. So I'm training three days a week. I have a training partner, which I haven't had a training partner in over a decade. And I uh, did legs today was like lower body um, for the well, week started week three today. And what's interesting is I haven't seriously weight trained, like, like try to put on strength and pretty much since my hernia surgery in uh, 2015, I think it was 14. Hmm. And doing it right <laughs> versus the way I was doing it before feels so damn good. It feels so good. So. Well, gosh, I'm sure happy to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like there's really something to this exercise thing, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> We've, I, it, we're just completely broed out on this uh, podcast. It's really come full circle. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure there were fantasies about uh, like this would be a a fitness podcast. Like we'll get your we we'll get your body healthy or something like that. But we have. I mean, if for those who have been listening since we started this show, we've really gone on and off the rails about all kinds of interesting things from religion to governance to different uh, histories and principles throughout the ages. And I like, for some reason, it just makes me laugh that we're coming back to leg day. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, so I am, um, I'll be 42 in October and uh, you don't look a yeah. day over 41. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh <laughs> There's this idea that that there's a seven year cycle, seven chakras, seven years, and there's mm -hmm. a, a recycling that happens, and um, yeah, it it uh, it does feel that way. Like the the amount of uh, ambition that I'm feeling around strength and conditioning, business, um, my relationship, yeah, it just feels very. Uh, like a like a new stage. It's really nice. What what sparked this idea? Was it just the uh, the training partner jumping in and saying, "Hey, do you want to do some training?" Were you it was my um... idea? It's my idea. Okay, I was, I was uh, hanging out with some friends, and uh, my training partner is Alex Rubchinsky, and he is a incredible coach himself. And we're having dinner and I uh, I was thinking, man, we should like both of us know we should be training more and we basically just do enough to maintain. And, you know, what if we just got together once a week? So I said, let's let's train once a week. So we got in the gym and we loved it. And he goes, why are we doing this just once a week? Do we want to like get strong or just fuck around? Uh, I go, let's get strong. I mean, why not? Why not get strong? And mm. uh, and so he goes, three days a week. I go, perfect. So I was pushing for one day a week. And what, what hit me was I was talking to Ashley about how like she really likes to train in groups for the psychological motivation aspect mm. of things. And I was like, yeah. And I witnessed like how much she needs that. And I have enough personal motivation to maintain training in isolation, but to actually push. And I go, here I am thinking that she needs it when I could probably use that too. And so that's hmm. what inspired the first idea. And then, and then of course, this is, this is a great thing about training partners. Cause then my training partner goes, what the fuck are we doing? Are we going to, we're going to actually get strong. It's like, okay. So having someone who's actually going to push you a little bit, so he is definitely the gas and I am the brakes of the relationship. He's also 
seven years younger. So interesting. Another mm-hmm. another seven year cycle there. I'm also That's seven right. years younger, actually. Yeah. Yeah. A bunch of youngsters. So so I'm one cycle behind you, I guess. I guess so. Hmm. How's that feel to be less than? In this case, it's uh, pretty good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that's cool, man. Um, you're not training for anything specific, I'm assuming. Just generally, you would like to get stronger rather than maintain at this period in your life. Yeah, I, I, I've got enough routine in my life where it, that's very doable. Um, I've also just got excited about training overall. I've got a, one of my best friends. He uh, just decided to start running some uh, off-road races. Uh, I guess it would fall in the ultra marathon category. Some of them are shorter than a marathon, but he starts running them. And I go, well, what are you doing for training? He's like, you know, I'm just like, I go out there and I run and I just add miles. And I'm like, oh, okay. I don't say anything to him because he's got a month. He's got like a, a race coming up in less than a month. And I just kind of keep talking to him about it. And then mm. after he races, I go, you know, I used to train ultra marathoners for a living. Like I used to train people for up to a hundred mile races. And you goes, did? Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think you did a good job? I did a better job than most coaches at the time. That was an excellent dodge of the question, by the way. That was that was so nice. It's like, do you eat healthy? I eat healthier than McDonald's. Uh, <laughs> I, I did a good job. I wouldn't I wouldn't train somebody the same way now. Um, I would definitely right. be, uh, but yeah, tra- train them well. Uh, they stayed injury free. They ran the races. They performed well. Um, had a guy. I took him from five k. He just wanted to finish the 5K and like within six months, we had him to a 50K. So, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. So, not, not too shabby. Um, but yeah, I just, I'm, I'm real big on running mechanics and all that. So, talking to him yeah. got me all like, I'm like, dude, I'll, I'll train you. Like, let's sit down, talk about a program and get it all mapped out and make sure you stay healthy. So, yeah, just, uh, witnessing my mind thinking about training again, which I haven't obsessed over how to improve physical performance. Um, Well, you've had a long break is what it sounds like to me. You haven't really been interested in it for quite a while. Yeah. I think I had so much momentum and I saw other areas of my life that needed improvement that it was okay to back burner it. I mean, I remember, you know, take, in the middle of that break, people, guys going like, oh man, how do I like, I want to look more like what you got going on. I'm like, I'm hardly doing anything. I'm I'm like swinging some ropes around. I swing some kettlebells here and there, crawl around, but I'm not like training. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, you know, what's it going to take? I was like, well, I trained really fucking hard for like three hours a day for 15 years. That- See, that's the big <laughs> asterisk, right? I I tell people that all the time. They're like, what do you do for training? I was like, dude, like yesterday, it was the day before yesterday in the gym. I took a 100-pound sandbag, and I walked around with it for 10 minutes in a bear hug. Yeah. And I did I did squats whenever I felt like it. And then afterward, I pushed the sled for a while. And then it's I. It's like, how much weight did you do? You're like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, I, I, and it really doesn't matter, especially with stuff like that. And they're like, "Wow, that that's it." I'm like, "Yeah, that was it yesterday." But you got to understand, I was a maniac for roughly 14 years, training all the time with nearly malicious intent toward the opponents in the sports that I was competing at. So it's not really fair to say, oh, what I'm doing now is what's getting me the results I have now. There's such a gargantuan asterisk next to it, which is like, but also I trained hard for 15 years prior. (laughs) And that's that's why it's so tricky 
when you're like, how do I find a good program? And you're like, oh, well, this guy looks good. I'm like, yeah, well, if you put that much effort into the worst program in the universe and the worst diet plan in the universe, you are still going to get excellent results, provided you are progressively stressing the system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, when I was when I was coaching fitness and people would come to me like, like, oh, I want to do so and so's program. Like all these CrossFit Games athletes were posting what they do online. Right. I want to do that. Mm -hmm. what? I'm like, why? Because it works for them. I'm like, it works for them right now. And no one wanted to hear it at the time. I'm like, and they're on gear. You know, they're they're using steroids. Like, let's be fucking real. Uh, not all of them, but enough of them to where. That there's a there's another there's another factor that's not being considered. It's like this guy's running that much volume for three four years in a row without taking a break. I'm pretty sure his endocrine system would be fried by now. Well, and like, what are you doing it for anyway? What what's the what's the purpose here? I always bring up the I tale of podium. two ties. I want to look. I want to look cool. I always bring up the tale of two ties. You know, it's one of my favorites and it's the difference between Muay Thai and Tai Chi. Mm. And if you had a Muay Thai practitioner and a tai, T tai Chi practitioner fight each other at age 20, the Muay Thai practitioner would likely destroy the Tai Chi practitioner. But if you had them fight at age 60, the Muay Thai practitioner would likely be long dead and unable to even show up for the fight. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's like <laughs> there, there's a, there's a cost benefit. It's kind of like being an offensive lineman in the NFL. What's the job description? Well, you need to be roughly 300 pound monster. And we're, we're looking at minus 15 to 20 years off your lifespan. And they're like, yeah, okay, deal. And then you see their workout plan and men's health. And everyone's like, oh, I guess I'll do that. Or, or right. whatever the sport is. Take your pick. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's nice to be training now without really uh, – with nothing other than just be strong and not even trying to get strong at any particular lift. It's just like, yeah, let's make our lower body strong. We'll spend six weeks on deadlifts, and then the next six weeks we'll do some Bulgarian split squats. And the next six mm -hmm. weeks we'll do some front squats. Who, who knows? And – um yeah, but yeah, not really preparing. Just just looking at to prepare strength in you know a lot of different ways, and then uh, it's so easy. It sounds now. fun. It, it's a lot it sounds of fun. fun. You have I mean, a training partner. That's that's huge. I think that if you are exercising, it should either be. You know, I'm a bit of an extremist. I don't know if any of the listeners have picked up on that, but. <laughs> Basically, the way I look at training is it's either a meditation of solitude and exploration of yourself, or ideally, it would be some sort of communion with one or more people where mm -hmm. you're interacting and engaging together. And there's some relationship boosting and a shared goal or just shared space. And... Uh, I think both of those are valuable to different personality types. I notice that women are more likely to be in a group class and men are more likely to find a training partner. That makes sense. Yeah. Women tend to be more communal. Mm. The, um, yeah, the, the finding of a training partner is very difficult. So first off, you know, we hang out two hours a day, three days a week. So it's got to be somebody I can hang out with and have conversations beyond getting yoked, right? We got to we got to share a sense of humor. We've got to uh, be okay with each other's music. We we just got to like we got to enjoy being around each other. It's kind of like people talk about choosing a tattoo artist. I'm like, dude, like I was in the chair for probably over thirty hours for my tattoos. Mm -hmm. I wanted to like my tattoo artist. I, my first tattoo artist was a fuck was terrible to hang out with. So I switched tattoo artists. I was like, Oh, I like hanging out with this guy. 
So one is having someone to hang out with. And the other one is training with somebody who's knowledgeable enough about training that I'm not the one constantly trying to keep us from doing dumb stuff or coaching all the time <laughs> or, or needing to put the workouts all together all by myself. And so having a training partner where we are each bringing knowledge to the table around how to get strong and he has his contributions and I'm learning new stuff and I'm bringing stuff to the table where he he's, he's learning new stuff. And so it's like, we're, we're building this new thing together. We're building the training program together. We're not just following somebody's suggestions. So it's mm -hmm. like, um, it's also an exercise in using our, our knowledge about training and putting into practical application for, for us. So finding a training partner that checks all those boxes, is very difficult, but I feel very fortunate to have that now. That's awesome. I mean, that's a good recommendation for anyone listening. If you're having a hard time, uh, finding some intrinsic motivation to do it yourself, uh, turn it into a, a social hour where you also get some fitness benefits out of the deal. And there are a ton of partner exercises that you can do with another person, but you simply cannot do on your own. And that's where it gets really incredible. You know, I have martial arts background in several different disciplines. And I always, I, I laugh thinking about how unathletic a lot of exercise makes you. It doesn't really give you an athletic foundation for commanding 3D space, whether right. it's dodging, striking, kicking, throwing, climbing, uh, evading, all these different things. And so if you have the benefit of having a training partner of some kind, try to make it interactive. I mean, one of the things that I like to do with uh, people that I coach is I have them hold on to a Swiss ball and I just try to wrestle it away from them. Mm. And it's a good way to bring in some wrestling without the risk and with all, also without the, the intimacy of wrestling. Not right. like romantic intimacy, but you're really inside. I mean, maybe it ends up that way. Bully for you, but uh, <laughs> I've had a couple so of jujitsu sessions go <laughs> pretty far. <laughs> Mike's doing traditional Spartan workouts, which involves a little sodomy afterward. Uh, naked, naked wrestling <laughs> is where it's at. <laughs> um, but something like that where it's um, it, there's a little bit of competitiveness and there's this dynamic agility where you're reacting to a chaotic stimulus. And that's something that you can't do on your own. And so I, I really like to emphasize those things when I do have a training partner available and when I'm working with a client as well, because I'm still seeing a couple personal training clients and you know, there's so much you can do with partner exercise, manual resistance exercises. You can match the force curve perfectly. So you can make a rep perfectly difficult every time once you uh, like learn each other's movements. And it's, it's really cool. But the uh, martial arts aspect and then the partner resistance training aspect those two things are absolutely huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've been getting out of this is training with Alex because he's a he's a Czech practitioner. Is mm -hmm. he's got all these fun little exercises I never seen with the Swiss ball. Mm. So it's like oh, those things okay. are awesome. Yeah, so good. So good. I mean, I remember a time in fitness where everyone was poking fun at that. But if you don't know how to use it, yeah, it seems silly, but when you know how to use it, it's fucking great. I mean, uh, bench press. I wrote an apology article to the Swiss Did ball, you? actually. And it's a, it's a picture of me hugging the Swiss ball. You it should have uh, <laughs> tagged Paul Check in that because he got so much shit for that over the years. He's the one well, that introduced it to the, the industry. You know, it's just like the BOSU, you know, um, and like 
step ups. Oh, what are you, an aerobics class, you fucking fairy? Or are you uh whatever? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I was I was twenty years old. I wanted to be cool, right? And so if I saw someone I liked say something demeaning something, I was like, Oh, I guess I will demean that thing too. I guess that thing sucks. Same. And so you don't <laughs> you don't you don't see the big picture because you're so interested in being accepted into the tribe. But the whole idea of vilifying or uh, glorifying or deifying a tool just makes you a tool, basically. <laughs> yeah. 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 Swiss ball is great. It's amazing how much pressure they can withstand. Well, they're, they're not all created equal. So this is a fact. <laughs> they're not all created equal. You want to make sure that you have one that's got a high rating scale and anti burst. On it. Anti burst, and you want to make sure that uh, it's it's rated for the weight that you need, and that yep. it's you know it hasn't been sitting out in the sun and doing all that because we we bench press off a of Swiss ball, and the Don't idea of leave it out in the sun. Don't leave anything rubber out in the sun. No, no. But the idea of being on a Swiss ball and having a a uh, for a bench press and having it burst, and we, we're in a oh cage, so. It would be we would be perfectly fine. You're bench pressing with a barbell on a Swiss ball. Yeah. Does the does the Swiss ball wiggle around side to side, front to back, too, or is it more like fixed? It's not fixed. No, we are responsible for the stability. Wow, I've only done it with dumbbells. I've never thought to do it with a barbell. It's great. It's really, really great. Um, huh. Apart, you know, having someone spot you is highly recommended. Uh, doing it inside of a cage is great, you know, uh, but mm. yeah, I, uh, I had my second time ever benching off a Swiss ball, uh, the other day and I was, I haven't bench pressed in like 10 years. So mm. just that whole movement, I'm, I was recalibrating and now I'm doing it on an unstable surface, mm. uh, which is great because it lets the shoulders do some stuff that you really can't do otherwise. Uh, posturally, I think it's superior. Uh, but I did, you know, I pulled 195 out of the rack and then I went to do my first rep and then I felt a little wiggle and I had to pause for a second. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> this isn't, this isn't a power lifting bench press. This is a, like, I need to create stability in my body. I'm, my core is engaged. My glutes are engaged. Uh, there's, there's nothing that, I'm not allowed to relax the rest of the body. Like the body is, is engaged in the process of creating stability so I can press this thing. And, uh, I used to get shoulder pain on bench press, but uh, you know, I, I think the Swiss ball helps with that amongst, you know, just doing a bunch of corrective exercise that, that fixed the problem that was causing it. Right. Let's imagine what you've done over the last 10 years since your previous bench press. I mean, it's oh yeah, like my guess my is shoulders basically. Yeah, my guess is you've spent over a hundred grand on your health, uh, orthopedically in the last ten years, and probably over a hundred to a thousand hours, somewhere in that range. Probably, yeah, yeah, at least a hundred grand. It's probably the Swiss <laughs> ball, though. It's probably the Swiss huh? ball. <laughs> it's probably the Swiss ball, though. I'll give it all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that yeah, and like a... now I'm, I'm, I'm willing to do all these exercises that I used to deem, you know, it's like, fuck, this is boring. Like, do I really need to do it? Now I'm like itching for that, that, you know, that, that core exercise at the end where there's a lot of attention going into like making sure everything's mm -hmm. working properly. Man, it's so interesting. So there are two concepts that, uh, I think about a lot when it comes to exercise selection and execution, let's say. One is the shape versus the link. So if you look at, uh, I remember there was this trend. It was like the exercise version of eat this, not that. And there'd be like a green check mark on one picture and a big red X on another picture. And the interesting thing is, that you can have a perfect looking shape and then the person can be like, ouch, ouch, that hurts my back. Let's say a hip hinge, for example. 
So the difference between the pretty shape that your body makes and the kinetic linkage between all the parts of the kinetic chain is typically invisible, right? And sometimes actually making the shape a little bit worse makes the link a little bit better because this whole idea of a good shape and a bad shape is also more or less an illusion fabricated by gatekeepers to show you the right way to do something, which is, is their way. You know, this is the right way to do something. So if you're not, well, here's feeling, the thing though. I mean, you know, you're, you do marketing. If you tell somebody this is the right way to do it, then they'll do it. Well, that's why I'm uh, not as good at it anymore. I'm, I'm like a lackadaisical missionary who just landed in South America. I'm like, Hey guys, we got this thing. It's called the Bible. My man, Jesus, he's cool guy. I know you guys are all into sun gods and Quetzalcoatl and all that stuff, but we're just going to leave a couple of these books here for you. And if you like it, great. If you like it, great. If not, no big deal. We'll just come back in, see how things are going. Like I said, if you want to stick with Quetzalcoatl, that's fine. That's not how you convert, right? The way to convert is you have a Bible in one hand and a flaming sword in the other hand, and you say, pick one. And by the way, even if you pick the Bible, we might still have to use the flaming sword to destroy your former culture and smite our enemies, right? <laughs> so, so yes, there's definitely that. You need to have hardcore conviction uh, to convert. I mean, it's no surprise that all of these share the same uh, root word. So there's the shape versus the link. And then there's also the stimulus versus the resistance. So we get so hell bent on lifting more pounds or more kilograms. Frankly, if you just want the number to be big, measure everything you lift in grams, and then the numbers will be tremendous. I always say the easiest way to lose weight and get stronger is you measure your weights in grams. And then you measure yourself in stone. So you're not going to be more than like 20 stone. So your body weight will be very small number. And then the weights that you lift will be very big number. And then you will get all the gratification that you need from those numbers matching up the way you want. <laughs> so, so if, but here's the thing. If you are so bent on lifting more pounds you're going to ignore the shape versus the link and you're not going to pay as much attention to the stimulus that you're actually trying to get a response from. And so there are all types of things that you can do to get a better stimulus where perhaps the weight will be smaller, but the stimulus and the effect and the response to that stimulus will be far, far superior. And when you can extract those fit myths from your psyche, you will get much better results and you'll, it's so uh, rare to injure yourself if you focus on those two things. I actually, um, my buddy at the gym asked me the other day, well, when was the last time I hurt myself uh, exercising? And I couldn't remember. Tr training wise, I, I always feel really good from it. Now I've uh, had some issues with combat sports and tennis and things like that. But I think those chaotic environments, it's somewhat natural. But exercise wise, I can't even remember the last time. And it's because of the focus uh, on the link uh, within the kinetic chain of my body. And then also the, the indifference at the amount of pounds being lifted and the focus on the stimulus that is eliciting a response from. Yeah. I think, uh, we were doing some assistance work the other day. He goes, how many, how many did you do? I go, I don't know. Went till I was tired. Like maybe, maybe 10, maybe 12. Wasn't really keeping track. I was fairly focused on what I was feeling in my body mm -hmm. versus counting the reps and, uh, I actually like um, doing things for time instead of reps. It's like, yeah, just 
do as many push-ups that feel good in the next minute, but don't count how many you did. And, mm-hmm. and now that, that creates, um, yeah, I've been thinking about this more of like being time, uh, measuring with time versus by measuring how much of the task was completed can in, in certain situations and a lot of situations create more presence with the process. Mm. Uh, because I, I think probably because there's so much, there's been so much emphasis on task oriented, uh, completion, uh, mm-hmm. in our, in our society. If you just go, yeah, uh, just run in a circle for 30 minutes, but don't keep up with how far you went. Just, uh, focus on how you feel that would be an enlightening process for people. Mm. I also like using timed sets. Like I'll, I'll typically do that with my, uh, leg training practice. I'll do one minute sets with like a Mm. 10 second transition. So I'll do something like a right crescent kick for one minute, left crescent kick for one minute, right. Uh, side kick for one minute, left side kick for one minute. And then I'll do a horse stance for like five minutes or something. And it just depends on what's going on. But if you think about what's going on in a one minute set, if you are going at a high enough rate of difficulty, high enough rate of speed, you're still going to be in that anaerobic threshold. So you're going to be stimulating a muscular response and the it kind of flies in the face of this i would argue pretty archaic concept of the strength and hypertrophy rep ranges you know 8 to 12 is muscle 15 or more is endurance uh 4 to 6 is strength but then if you look at the people with the largest natural muscles on the planet, it's like indoor cyclists and speed skaters, where there's a tremendous power requirement. So anaerobic power. And one minute is actually uh, not a very long time. You know, you're well within that anaerobic threshold. So there are certain tests that you can do. It's like, look, if you can't do 30 step ups on one leg in one minute, Uh, there's probably a lot of room for you to grow in that particular exercise. It's not even tremendously fast, but you're still going to be working strength and hypertrophy, even though the reps seem very high. It's really interesting how you can get pigeonholed into that um, classic rep range fallacy. And if you look up how they discovered it, it's kind of, it's kind of whack. Uh, like you start digging into why, why people believe that. And most of it is just because, well, that's what the uh, last guy said. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's how it is with like, uh, the knee, don't let your knees go over your toes during a squat. Right. It's like, uh, there was like translation, never walk down the stairs ever. (laughs) Yeah. There's like one doctor wrote an article (laughs) once in the sixties and then it became gospel. But um, time sets, time sets, anaerobic capacity. Oh, I I had the opposite experience is for nine years. I trained in the eight to 12 rep range for nine years because I want to put on mass, right? All Mm -hmm. I want to do was put be be bigger because I I felt scrawny. And then I found weightlifting and I get into this. uh, I take a weightlifting class in college. And I thought that I already knew what weightlifting was, but then I got in and they go, oh, there's the snatch and the clean and jerk Olympic weightlifting. And I go, oh, never done that before. I'll give it a shot. Uh, these guys look yoked. So uh, I started training it and really fell in love with, with snatching clean and jerk. And so I started training under a coach and, you know, he's got me doing sets of five sets of three sets of one for the first time Mm -hmm. in my life. I'm uh, a moving weight, uh, a pretty heavy load as fast as fucking possible. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I'm lifting 
a lot heavier, fewer reps, lo much lower volume than what I'd been. My, my volume was cut by uh, quite a bit. Uh, and all of a sudden, my traps, which I always wanted to have bigger traps, just fucking blew up. My ass blew up. My quad, mm -hmm. I, like everything just all of a sudden, I just put on weight within a few months. It was just, I, I was like, oh, okay. And, uh, and that's all I needed. And the nine years of, all the, the higher volume training definitely lent itself to being able to make those, those gains quickly with the lower volume, the heavier weight. But yeah, it, you know, I later did some genetic testing and they, they go, Oh yeah, you're, uh, you're built for speed. You're, you're going to respond best to low rep ranges, uh, high loads, high speed, uh, interval training, uh, anything that's, you know, high reps or endurance, you're just not going to respond as well. That's just kind of, uh, what you're set up genetically for. And I had a few friends also do genetic testing and they were on the, the endurance side, you know, the higher rep ranges. Mm. And it was so funny because it's like, it was so easy for me to get strong and fast and so hard to build endurance. And for them in order to be strong, mm. they needed to do higher rep ranges to build that strength. And mm -hmm. it, it was after the test, we go, well, this explains everything we've been, we've been noticing up until this point. Yeah. From what I understand, your fiber types are mainly genetic. I don't, I think you can change them a little bit through training, but I think the, um, concentration of fiber types. Yeah. So you have like two types of fast twitch and then you have one type of slow twitch uh, like one, two, and then two X or something like that. Um, there might even be a third one. Um, but I think that's largely genetic. So you, the, you can, that's my adjust, understanding of it. You can adjust the amount a little bit, but some fibers will pretty convert, much, but yeah, some will convert like, like the two, so, a, like the, the, the type two fibers will convert to, you know, basically there's untrained and then when you start training them they they convert but from a type two to a type one rare mm. and when you think about it you would want to have that full spectrum of skills like you would want to be able to move something really fast and heavy once you would want to be able to do something 30 to a hundred times also and yeah. every, and everything in between. Like, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you want to be able to do that? Especially if you're even considering what might be practical for life, which it's, it's rare that you're going to need to lift something heavy one time. It's well, much whole, more likely. Cause the whole premise of CrossFit was mm -hmm. the, from a philosophical perspective, the, the state, the, their ability to state the problem was better mm -hmm. than anybody had done up to that point, uh, in my opinion. Uh, their solution was pretty good. Uh, we could poke holes on it all day, but it was, pr it was better than what most people were doing. Let's um, do that. Let's poke holes in that all day and really just filter out any... No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think, I think CrossFit would have, I'll just say this. I think it will, would have advanced the, the evolution of, of understanding and movement and the practice of it would have evolved, uh, much further, faster, had there not been the CrossFit games. I think the CrossFit games pretty much, uh, retarded the growth of, uh, the, the innovative, uh, side of CrossFit. But it was also responsible for wide, 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 worldwide adoption of CrossFit. Without the games, not it, it would not be as popular as it is. So, um, you know, I think that the yeah that that's where we're at with it. So you actually have to get outside of CrossFit at this point to be introduced to just like rotational movements. Right. It, it's almost like. Uh, exercise is basically rehabilitation for a lifestyle that is unhealthy. And then you also have 
the rotation that you're talking about, you almost need that as rehabilitation for doing everything in the front to back and up to bottom, uh, top to bottom plane. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think in order to have a rational perspective on exercise, you have to realize that it's very unnatural. The whole concept of exercise is kind of insane, actually, when you think <laughs> about it. You know, it's it's not specific, which is how which is the first word in the said principle, specific adaptation to impose demand. So you need to have a really good reason to have an exercise in your plan. And you need to already have a population that is living in an unhealthy way for it to even make sense. Because otherwise you would be climbing and running and carrying stuff and you would you would move well and naturally and frequently. And um, the idea of doing a, a clean and jerk would look weird. You'd be like, what? Why would I? Why would I do that? That's outrageous. Yeah. You think about uh, you watch the little kids and they move so well <laughs> without any instruction at all. And then around five years old, you put them in a seat and tell them not to move for eight hours a day. And oh God, now, now you got to rehab that, right? Right. Do you think it's more physically damaging or more psychologically damaging? Probably more psychologically, I would think. You know, I, I, I think it's hard to actually pull the two apart. Um, <laughs> no doubt. The Well, th this is inter something interesting. So like, like sitting got a really bad rap. Uh, about a decade ago, yeah. right? Uh, Kelly Stewart, totally. it's his fault. And basically came around and said, we need to have standing desks in schools. And there was a big thing. And I was like, yeah, I, got, I had a standing desk. I still do. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't use it to stand that very often. It, it moves up and down. I do a lot more sitting. Sitting is pretty now. comfortable. Sitting is it's pretty great. comfortable. Uh, I like sitting. I find you it, got a it's big way easier chair. for me to, it's easier for me to focus for, you know, 90 minutes straight on a project if I'm not uh, shifting around on my feet. But what I, what I discovered for myself is if I would back when I was stressed all the time, mm. I would get on an airplane and getting out of that seat on the airplane was, it was tough. It was like, everything was tight. Everything was creaky. Yeah. And I, I was on airplanes a lot. And so, um, I really got into breathing and not just, you know, like Wim Hof style breathing and like heavy breath work, but just learning to breathe well throughout the day, having good breathing mechanics, chilling the fuck out, doing some emotional development work uh, and, and uh, being more accepting of myself in the world. And, I noticed that I could sit for hours and hours and hours and hours and get up and I was just fine. And then every once in a while I would sit down for a few hours and I would get up and I would feel stuck. I go, what's the difference? And then one day it clicked and I go sitting really, you know, if you sit too much, it's going to have negative impacts no matter what. But I think the majority of the negative impacts that happen due to sitting is because people are experiencing stress while sitting. They're, they're mm. holding their breath for moments. Like one of the ways I like to spot stress in somebody is if you catch them holding their breath, you as a trainer, mm. you know, this, cause you see someone in the gym, you're teaching them a new movement and they, their ne nervous system goes into overwhelm. So what do they do? They hold their breath. You're like, Hey, you should mm. probably be breathing. We're exercising here. And so, um, I found that if I can have nice, smooth, I think the key is smooth nasal breathing while I sit for hours and work on a project, I can get up and I feel fine. So the, the going mm. back to the, the sitting kids in his classroom, you know, you go, is it psychological or is it, is it physical? It's like, wow, you put a kid in the classroom and they're stressed out the whole time. Then yeah, it's, it's the, the fit, the physical is a manifestation of what's happening psychologically. Yeah. And I would say, forget the standing desk. You just got to end public school. It's one of the worst things you could do to a kid. It's, it's no <laughs> surprise which side of my bread is buttered on at this point. It's catastrophically bad. You give a kid a dog and a lemonade stand, they'll be better off by age 11 than they are at age 18 
after going to public school and they yeah. will have been less physically and psychologically tormented. Yeah. There uh, was, uh, I, I, I remember, I remember thinking the same thing. I'm like, someone was like, yeah, we should get, we should get staying desk in schools. Don't you agree? I'm like, why, uh, should they even be in a classroom? I mean, we're talking about the desks, but like they're stuck in a fucking room <laughs> all day under fluorescent lights. Like the whole, the whole thing is bad. If we're, and that's not only if totally. we're looking at the physical aspect of it, like if we're only looking at the physical aspect of it, we go, okay, you have fluorescent lights, uh, you're inside a room, usually like one small window that no one's really allowed to look out. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's weird. Everyone's facing the same it sure direction. Is. It sure is. It sure is weird. It's totally whack. And it it's we're the, the weirdos. Same. It's the same. Oh, man. You know, there's nothing that a group of parents with kids in school loves be better than me saying how school is way worse than it is good. <laughs> <laughs> they all really like that. I've triggered some parents, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I don't even try to trigger anybody. I have just tried to be a little bit more honest as I get older. But it's like choosing exercises for your training plan. What do you teach the kids in the school? What exercises do you do? What stimulus do you introduce to the organism? And sit, sitting is great. There's no perfect posture. In fact, um, there are some people whose posture is too upright and they can't really flex forward in their middle back. And that's a different problem, right? So this... Once again, if you want to be a knight, you got to have a dragon somewhere. So if there's no dragons around, you'll you'll make one up so you can be a knight and save the princess. <laughs> so what are you doing for training these days? I told you, I, uh, I play with a stick. I play with a rope. I practice uh, some martial arts forms. The other day, I held my arms out to the side with my fingers and wrists extended for nine minutes and 45 seconds, which is not my best, but I'm getting back into it. And that's a little bit more like meditation than, you know, the best shoulder exercise and uh, practicing my horse stance. I'm always doing like some a martial sort of arts horse stance or like on all fours horse stance. Uh, martial arts horse stance. Okay. I'll do that for like five minutes or something. And usually it's a little bit more dynamic than that. I'll just kind of hover around the middle range and then glide back and forth, front to back, up, down, pitch forward, and try to explore the space that I'm able to go. Um, always some sort of hanging. I mean, you know, from primal athleticism it's roll bounce balance crawl climb carry and then for rehab it's rub squeeze and shake and that way it just makes it more like a daily practice with a couple of check boxes to mark off um yeah i mean i love uh partner exercises though you know uh different types of standing rows like i haven't done uh bench press except for maybe a hollow bench press in a long time I usually do a standing uh, lunge press. So I'll get yeah. in a lunge position and I'll press with a band or a pulley or something like that. And there's a really nice integration you get from that. I've been and, doing some uh, offset uh, rows that way too, standing rows with a cable. Those are the two best upper body exercises, I think. A so lunge good. press and a lunge row at a bunch of different angles. You're good to go. And... Uh, you know, lately I've been doing this cool drill, which is a sliding reverse lunge uh, with a band pulling you down and backwards. And I've gotten really good results from the people I've tested it with at the gym. You can get a really deep hip hinge, knee bend, ankle flexion. And rather than just going straight up and down, there's an up and down aspect, but there's also a front to back aspect. So it adds a forward intent to the exercise. And I'm always thinking, you know, is it 
is it worth it to do this exercise? It better have something really juicy there or at least be fun and just play. So that's, that's kind of how I evaluate whether or not we should actually waste our time doing something. Otherwise, we should just play games and wrestle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's got to be a good reason. Always doing isometrics. I got two Pilates rings at the Walmart the other day uh, that have no handles on them. So it's just a neoprene covered one inch by maybe an eighth of an inch metal ring. And I can stack them up to crush them and pull them apart. And they provide a ton of resistance. So I can just move that thing around and really, especially when they're doubled up. About. I'm going to have never to never used it up. a Pilates ring. No. So imagine a plot, a ring of metal that is flat. So it's a flat strip of metal that comes all the way around full circle. And if you put your hand on either side of the circle and you squeeze it in, it becomes almost like a little eight. And so there's resistance. If you squeeze it together, there's resistance. If you pull it apart, and I just got two so that I could double them up. And when my arms are straight out in front of me and I try to squeeze it together, I, I cannot get the, the thing to touch in the middle. So it's got way more resistance for that straight arm push pull than I can even uh, squeeze into this thing. So it's perfect for some very dynamic isometrics because it's a little more lively than just if you squeeze a wood ring you can squeeze as hard as you like but there's no feedback right that you get with the elasticity of the metal so that's that's a fun new thing you can uh add that to a front raise i found was pretty cool so i'll put a little climbing once again it's all coming back to that idea of Where's the kinetic chain linkage versus what pretty shape am I creating? I really, you know, d doesn't matter what it looks like as long as I'm getting the desired kinetic linkage and the training effect. So I'll add like a, a 10, 15 pound weight to the bottom with a climbing harness, and then I'll do a crush and then a front raise. So there's a dynamic squeezing that I have to do in. And then as I'm lifting the weight up overhead, it's making sure that my pecs are on while I am lifting my arms overhead. And it's another good way to test mobility because you'll be able to lift your arms overhead without a ring all the way back past your ears. But as soon as you have to crush together and keep that bridge of tension across the front of your shoulders, you'll realize, oh my gosh, I don't have as much mobility that's connected that way as I thought I might mm -hmm. have had. So, you know, uh, it's hard to explain my training to people because I find it fun to create new tools in the garage and I, I have the luxury to, to just play around for a long time. Like I... <laughs> There have been a lot of storms uh, lately, and a bunch of tree branches have fallen. And so I've been going out into the park with an axe and harvesting wood. And I just got a, a, a huge log. It's probably 12 inches in diameter and like 20 feet long. And this was a branch off wow. of a eucalyptus. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand carve a few clubs out of the deal. But even just while I was uh, playing around with it, I was doing some leverage. Did you get the uh, whole leverage. log home or did you have to cut it up? I cut it in two, uh, two pieces. Yeah, one of them is probably still like 13 feet long, though. Whoa. So I'm carrying this thing on one shoulder. And while I'm there, I'm like, oh, I'll do some squats with it. You know, so I'm holding it onto my shoulder in like a big long lever. So I have like 10 feet worth of the log extended behind me and I'll just do a couple of squats be like, Oh, that's interesting. I'll do a couple of lunges and Oh, you know, hold it in an offset Zercher position, which is like the most difficult, uh, static side bending 
activity that you could do from standing. And yeah, I mean, all kinds of stuff like that. But for me, since I don't have any specific long-term training goals other than to continue being athletic enough to try whatever I want to try. And I think if you can do tennis and martial arts, you could probably do pretty much everything else, you know? (laughs) So as long as I have those capacities, you know, I, I climb trees a lot for pulling exercises. Uh, and I like it better than rock climbing because there's just something. Hmm. I guess I would say the word natural, um, but there's an energy to the tree that you feel and being up in a tree feels really grounding sort of ironically. And I, I just like that there's this three dimensional spider web of different handles and footholds. So I'll find myself 20 feet up a tree with my feet, uh, you know, six feet apart or something like that. And now I'm in this isometric near split deep lunge. And I'm like, Oh, I'll do a couple of pulses here uh, while I'm in this extreme stretched end range. And Oh, that feels really good. And then I'll, you know, move on to something else. And, there, there's a lot of that, but then I also get down to business with my one to uh, 10 minute density sets, like the carrying a sandbag for 10 straight minutes, I think is really good for the mind and body. And then being able to do one minute of something that's really hard, like a high step up on one leg and try to get 30 reps in a minute is also pretty nice, especially if you add just a small weight to it, your leg will just blow up. Love it. Yeah, it's it's a lot of different fun stuff, but uh, you know, if if the uh if the average person listening to this though doesn't have that same interest in exploring with different tools and different ranges of motion, they're going to be like that guy sounds like he's fully insane. Like it doesn't it doesn't match up with what exercise looks like. Well, most people don't see a tree and see an opportunity to climb it and, and, uh, you know, Oh, I can do all sorts of different pulling and different directions. I mean, I I've climbed a lot of trees and, uh, I actually attribute that to like having a strong upper body pulling, which is all the tree climbing I did as a kid. Mm. And, um, and, uh, one of the things that hit me, I, I was in uh, London and, uh, the train parkour and, we spent three or four days training parkour. One of the interesting things that happened psychologically was after, after spending a few days doing, doing parkour, I started seeing the city differently. I was Mm. like, Oh, I could jump from this to that, or I could climb on top of this, like everything, like the, the city in being in London, this city that could be quite stuffy. And we're running around <laughs> jumping on rails and doing things you're not supposed to do and uh, misusing things. And uh, hmm. in a city where people are so stuffy and, and prim and proper, uh, some, someone in London is hating me right now. But uh, it's... Probably more than one. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it transformed for me. Right. I saw the scene yeah. differently and I saw it as a playground and something that was really exciting. And, uh, it was a, it was a gift because it wasn't just London that I started viewing that way. I could see any city and any, I started looking around and like, see other opportunities. Uh, I'm not in as much practice with that now. And so I, I don't see it like I used to, but you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking Max walks around and goes, Oh, there's a tree. I should climb that. Whereas most people just walk mm. right by it, don't pay any attention. And I'm like, why, mm. why am I so fat? It's like, well, you could just go climb a tree for five minutes. That would be helpful. Well, if you see the world and the environment as something to play with and be with versus seeing it as just an avenue to get from point A to point B, it's, 
very transformative. And I think you could argue it's the same thing when you're sitting in the chair. If you're sitting in the chair and you're doing something that is play, you could probably sit in that chair for a very long time. Uh-huh. If you're sitting in the chair and you're doing something that is just to get from one thing to the next thing, it, it's going to be a very different experience. And that's why also the number one worker's compensation injury in non-physical labor is low back problems. It's not just the chair. It's the content of your mind while you're in the chair for so long. Yep. Yep. Mm. I like this circling back to exercise thing. You know, I have way more expertise at this than I do anything else, <laughs> but it it sort of interests me the most and the least, uh, if that makes sense. I, I can't I can't get away from it. I can't stop inventing new stuff in the garage or exploring my own abilities and trying to find new ways to make things a little little safer, a little bit more fun, a little bit more effective. But as far as improving someone's life across the board, it doesn't need to be anything fancy. Hike barefoot, climb a tree, carry a bag for a while, and you'll probably be mostly okay. Uh, you know, you could fit, you could fit a lifelong plan on an index card for, for fitness, but as far as finding a way to live in harmony with the surroundings, the people and the place and finding a way to harmonize the ego and these different aspects of yourself that get caught in a drama triangle so easily and learning how to manage your energy and your finances and relationships plays a much bigger factor. Obviously, I say obviously, sounds so arrogant. Of course, being fit and athletic and having a, a playful movement to you will make all of these things better. But when I look at what really takes people down, it's not just their athletic ability. It's more their ability to connect with people and with their, I I would say something like true self, which sounds a little esoteric, but it's when you strip away all of the bullshit that you accumulate naturally as you grow up in a culture that is as diseased as the one that that we have grown up in. And I think uh I think that's probably why I don't talk about fitness so much because it doesn't seem like the big domino to knock over to really help someone make a bigger change in their life. Even though it is certainly where I have the most <laughs> expertise to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like the the fitness is the result of living a good life. And there's a lot of things that go into that. And, you know, uh, you and I are both obsessed over it for so long. And, and, and I'm in the same way. You don't hear me talk about it very often, but I like to do it a lot. And mm-hmm. so, because it, it, it's, I think when you're doing it, it's so much more of a discovery process. And then when you're talking about it, you're just sharing what you discovered, but I think the deeper you get into it, the less words you're going to have for those discoveries. Like for me to be able to Mm -hmm. explain, you know, uh, how mastering this one particular type of crawl, uh, has changed my life. I, I really can't put that shit into words. Like it's, it's, uh, feeling that was pretty good start. (laughs) Changed your life. <laughs> Sounded okay. <laughs> yeah, change your life is kind of vague, you know. It's um, but there, the, this conversation changed my life. Yeah, I don't know, positive or negative yet, but it changed it for sure, no doubt. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot. There's a lot of things that when it comes up to, to health. I don't think you can really ever explain it. It just has to be felt. It has to be experienced. And, 
I think that mm. over time, when guys like ourselves have been talking about it for so long, it's kind of like, like you were saying, is I could talk about all these little nuances, but mm-hmm. first you got to like spend an hour with yourself a day moving. What's keeping mm-hmm. you from doing that? You know, because it's not for lack of a plan. Right. It's because you don't think it's important enough yet. Yeah. Well, I remember it really resonated with you. I said once about plantar fasciitis. I was like, just put your hands on your feet for five minutes a day. And I remember your face just lit up. And I was like, oh, that was a good one. (laughs) So so I remembered it better after seeing your reaction to it. And it's true, even now. And when you have enough of that stuff, it's like, look, if you really wanted to – go down the rabbit hole of self-care, it it would reasonably take a couple hours a day. Once you add in all these little things, a little bit of walking, a little bit of climbing, a little bit of uh, playing with a ball, a little bit of wrestling, a little bit of jumping and landing and skipping and all that stuff, it, it would be it would be a lot. Now, can you get by with 15 minutes? Absolutely. But you can't expect the the same type of transformative experience from that and that's kind of that that full circle yeah yeah Hmm. well that was fun yeah any uh closing thoughts there uh mr bledsoe fitness is uh is a thing to be discovered i believe it's uh it's uh it's not something that just you put a check in the box that you've completed that day. It's something that if you want to be good at it, you've got to really just love seeing how it makes you feel. Hmm. Yeah, that's nice. I would say get, get curious about it, make it more of a, an exploration and see if you can enjoy it and not, not judge yourself based on, what someone else can do, because let me tell you, that is a dead end. (laughs) (laughs) That is, that is not going to work out very well. Uh, Because on the off chance that you did actually uh, triumph over your peers that you're comparing against, uh, it still will not give you the satisfaction that you're after. So I would say, get curious and enjoy the process and, and make it a part of your, daily practice and either let it be silence and solitude um, and meditation and exploration, or let it be a better way for you to connect, uh, especially with other people, whether that's in a, a group or with just one other person, there's really a lot to be gained from both of those experiences. And just like with Mike, who was doing a lot of high reps and then he needed low reps Maybe you need quiet with yourself or maybe you need um, interaction with another human or multiple people. So enjoy the practice. Where can they find you, Mike? Uh, you can check up, check on uh, everything I'm up to on Instagram at Mike underscore Bledsoe. And uh, you can check out thestrongcoach.com. Rebuilt the site recently. Have a really oh. cool new offer up that I think you might like. Sexy. Sweet. You can find me, MaxShank.com, at MaxShank, or at uh, Ambition Athletics in Encinitas. I will catch you guys later. Love you, buddy. Love you.